classic millennial style. My speech is on my phone, so I hope you'll forgive me for using it. Today, hi, by the way, my name is Danielle Pua. I'm an incoming second year student in the college. Uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not an officer of my class. I'm just a regular student who can fall asleep in your class, so I apologize in advance. Um, but I'm here today to present a case study not on a rare clinical disease or an argumentative ethical stance. I'm here to present a case study on my generation, the millennial generation. A while ago, you heard from Dr. Sess um, about an educator's perspective on our generation. But today, I'm here to present our perspective, the student's perspective. Clinically, it's said that most diagnoses can be derived from a well-documented patient history. In the same breath, deciphering our generation can be done by looking into the way we grew up, the way we live, and thus the way we learn. Students in our generation, as previously um, acknowledged, were born during the late 80s to the late 90s, during which the Dewey Decimal, the Dewey Decimal Systems was still the means of cataloging libraries, mixtapes were still played in Walkmans, the Atari was the ultimate cool kid game, People wanted to play Pac-Man on it all the time, I hear. In those days, cell phones were huge, clunky, dinosaur devices that people had to lug around, and doctors still used pagers. Sometime in the early 90s, as exactly on the 6th of August, 1991, CERN released the World Wide Web to the public. It was a revolutionary moment, scribbled down by MIT's JCR Licklider in August 1962. He envisioned a globally interconnected set of computers through which everyone could quickly access data and programs from any site. We now know it was a historic moment, but at the time, we continued completely oblivious. For most of my childhood, and for most of your children's childhood maybe, we went on without the internet. We played outside, did normal kid things. But by the early 2000s, the internet boomed. Napster, the first social media site where users could trade music, was very controversial and it appeared quite fast. And so did Wikipedia, infamously known for its open source system where anyone from anywhere could download and upload data. This was the environment we grew up in, where Facebook, Snapchat, and Twitter are the norm. I hold my cell phone almost 24-7, and I can't go a day without using my Spotify account. This was the environment we had to adapt into. For most people born before 1981, we're known as the tech generation. We've developed a completely foreign vocabulary from everyone else. You might ask, what is Reddit? And why are people so obsessed with Pokemon Go? And why did everyone under the age of 35 panic when Niantic servers crashed? To most of you, this is how we look. We're always glued to our phones, we have this black expression when people cross the street when holding their phones, my dad complained so much. But the internet brought us more than just entertainment. The internet was what educated us. We learned that information could be accessed simply by typing a few keywords into Google. We read stories and ideas from the comforts of our own homes. The, inter the, the internet made our lives borderless. We watched video blogs on YouTube, followed breaking news as it happened, and shared personal experiences with loved ones halfway around the world. The internet allowed us to see the world through another's eyes, through photos like this and photos like this. After the terrorist attack in Nice, where a driver rammed his truck through a crowded street on a festival day, this photo went viral and resurfaced. It was a child caught in this complicated political crossfire. Our generation has the tendency to consume information at lightning fast speed. And one might wonder, how does anyone teach a generation that can access everything so casually? In our day and age, teachers don't just provide us knowledge. Great teachers give us direction, help us turn knowledge into learning, and help us find meaning in the information we're given. So firstly, our generation is accustomed to an overwhelming amount of information. Dr. Ting Aung, I hope I said that right, a Burmese author, wrote a story about four different students who specialized in their fields. 
Their teacher left them with one piece of advice when they finished studying. Too much knowledge make its fools. I'll make this a short summary. In the story, instead of using their knowledge to aid them in overcoming challenges, these students overanalyzed everything and then ended up quite at the mercy of their circumstance. Our generation understood quite early on that though knowledge is powerful, it was only a tool. To make good use of it, students needed help sifting information and focusing on what's important. Yes, we have all the resources at our fingertips. It can be overwhelming. This is why we appreciate teachers who help us answer the following questions. What specific information am I looking for? What is most important? Which resources are most liable, uh, reliable? When teachers in class give us specific objectives, this is how we learn. This is how we make sure that we don't read everything in, on the internet and get completely lost in the process. Secondly, like Dr. Seth said, gone are the days when the most effective way to teach students is through a lecture. Our generation has embraced that learning is non-linear. Some people may learn from, differently from other people. That's why during small group discussions or group discussions, it's nice to see how different learners come to the table and bring different things. These, these sort of things remind us that although, yes, books are necessary, yes, we can do this on our own, having peers who come from different environments and who can teach us different things are, are things we want to have. Um, we embrace individuality as a generation, and that translates into our education as well. We think that we particularly enjoy it when professors speak to us in our language. When Dr. Degana, for example, holds his Q&A on Twitter, creating the unique hashtag DocDexAnatomy, or when he uses his 3D anatomy app on his iPad, when Dr. Dan holds games like Four Picks One Word, every time he gives a lecture, it helps us stay engaged with professors and make sure that we're actually learning things that matter. Lastly, our generation doesn't see learning as an end in itself, just as Dr. Sess said. We crave meaning and purpose. Often, you hear our generation ask, why am I doing this? Or, what's the point of this? This is the reason why our generation probably has the highest rate of people quitting after the first year of whatever they're doing. A lot of people switch fields midway through their 20s. And we think that this is arguably the particular strength of our generation that will propel us to the front of our chosen fields. To us, learning ought to be purposeful. We like doing work that matters. If it doesn't matter to us, then why do it? So we appreciate it when our professors tell us stories of their successes and their failures. We like how the first uh, time Dr. O has put a catheter in a woman's body, it wasn't exactly the right way to do it. This is how we learn to be human, and this is how we learn that our professors are human as well. Most of all, we love learning how to get along with our peers. Being exposed to clinical environments and situations help us see beyond the books of right now. It can be frustrating being a first year student, expecting that you save the world being a doctor, and then ending up just stuck in your own books. We appreciate how learning takes a holistic approach in SLCM. The introduction to the medical profession module helps us grow as individuals when we learn about professionalism and teamwork and in general being a good person. For the sake of our own development as well as our patient's development, we think that this is essential. In closing, it might be an extremely challenging approach to teach a generation with the shortest, with the shortest attention span ever. But we thank you for doing so. Thank you for putting in the effort to keep our fire going. I believe that every student has a light inside them when they come inside med school. I think we're all idealists here. But it takes a great teacher and a great set of faculty members to keep that fire going and to make sure that our motivation doesn't get snuffed out. Thank you for allowing us to grow the best way we know how. Unconventionally, uniquely, and of course, millennially. Um, so that ends my speech. To continue uh, the talk on how we learn best, let me call Nix Manalastas. Thanks, Danny. Before I continue, I'd like to thank the administration for allowing us to attend this faculty assembly. We were laughing back there because Dr. Says really hit the bullseye when she 
made her talk. That's the millennial right there, and that's us. So I'd like to take this opportunity this morning to tell you how much we've learned. So this is me. This is the whole Lucan student body. We came to SLCM as seeds. And right now, here we are, seedlings. And we all know that it takes more than just water and sunlight to make a seedling grow. We need attention. We need time. We need love and nurturing. And we continue to grow through the years, blossoming into persons we never thought we could be. Looking after patients in groups, in twos, and finally, alone. But this could never have been possible without us learning from you. So I will tell you how we, how I, learn best. I learned best because you were on time. You made me feel and see the value of a person and the work that you do by maximizing all the time. You made me see how important it is to be there when you said you'd be there. And you made me feel that I am respected as a person and that my time is important and that it's important not to let the patient wait. I learned best through your demonstrations of how to examine a joint, how you'd see different gates when you have a neurological deficit, and how seeing the model of a female pelvis made me grasp the subject even more. I learned best when you teach the topic step by step, one day at a time until we reach our final destination. I never thought that a difficult subject such as pharmacology, neurology, and medicine could be taught in unconventional ways, in out of the ordinary, like writing on a blackboard just coming to classroom with a, with a whiteboard marker and taking out the whiteboard and writing every, everything there word for word and allowing the students to grasp every word and write it down in their notebooks. Millennials have developed the habit of taking pictures in PowerPoints and developing an even shorter attention span. And this made us remember how important it is to listen and to follow. Do you need a break? I, we appreciated how sensitive you were to our needs as medical students. CR breaks, coffee breaks, snack breaks, and even sleeping for five minutes before the next lecture. So that's me in the front row sleeping. And this isn't during the lecture, but this is during a break within the lecture. And it made us realize how important it is to stop and consolidate and rest for a while. And we see that, the, that our professors value this as much as we. I learn best when you remove all the anxieties a medical student faces every day. When I know I can study at my own pace and be guided by your lectures, I have nothing but more respect for you. I believe in you. Kaya mo yan. A medical student enters med school with lack of confidence despite all the achievements that we have garnered through the years. Why? Because med school is a different world altogether. There's never really an easy subject. There's never really enough time to study everything. But there are always good professors. Good professors who continue to encourage and inspire us through their passion and compassion. The final word that will get you promoted into the next level. 
is actually the grade. And when you told us not to mind grades, but think about our patients instead, how to help them, how to give them the best medical care, how to make them happy, and how to give them the best quality of life again, you've already led us halfway through. And so millennials are always caught up with the question, why am I doing this? We like to question the validity of what we do, its worth, especially when things get rough, when things get difficult, when we get burnt out. Now I know why I do what I do. I've always wanted to become a physician and a professor. And I know I will be one because behind every student's success is a great mentor. And so just wait for us. Wait for us from, to become the plant that you've planted or that you've cultivated from day one, from the seeds until we become just like you, still following your footsteps because it is always you who inspire us. Again, good day and thank you for this opportunity.